Ladies and gentlemen, this is TVP World. I'm your host, Benjamin Lee, and all welcome aboard the Eastern Express. Recent statements by Belarusian President Alexander Lukashenko have raised significant concern about the future direction of Belarusian politics and its international relationships. Lukashenko, in a rare moment of public introspection, acknowledged his mortality, hinting at the eventual need for Belarus to adjust to a future without his leadership. What does that mean for the future of Belarus? Let's take a look at a report to find out more. Belarusian dictator Alexander Lukashenko has acknowledged his deteriorating health for the first time. Due to a persistent pain in his leg, he plans to walk less and drive more. He emphasized, however, that he does not intend to die just yet. Media outlets have frequently reported on the supposed poor health of the Belarusian dictator. Recently, Belarusian opposition figure Pavel Latushko claimed that Lukashenko suffers from diabetes and might die soon. As a consequence, Belarus's political future remains uncertain. Lukashenko, who turns 70 in just over two weeks, has been ruling over Belarus since 1994. At the beginning of 2024, the dictator openly acknowledged his intention to participate in the country's 2025 presidential election. He also warned that there would be changes to the country's laws before the 2025 elections take place. In January, Lukashenko signed the law guaranteeing himself immunity, lifelong protection and state-provided property upon his resignation from the presidential office. All these decisions indicate that while Lukashenko may in fact be preparing to one day vacate his post, he does not intend to allow for the rise of Belarus's democratic opposition to power. Most likely, the presidential vote will be rigged, just like the ones before, carrying the risk of sparking new demonstrations and protests. And now, let's take a look at the issue in greater detail. The leader of Belarus stated that you should get used to the fact that I am not eternal, just like all of you. Now, this remark, well, seemingly a reflection on his own tenure, underscores the current political volatility in Belarus, as Lukashenko's authority and independence are increasingly caught between the influence of Russia and China. Pavel Latushko, a prominent Belarusian opposition leader, interprets Lukashenko's recent overtures towards Poland as part of a broader strategy to manipulate his position between these two major powers. Lukashenko's talk of normalizing relations with Poland, according to Latushko, is a deceptive tactic often used to gain leverage with Russia, especially as tensions have reportedly risen between Lukashenko and Vladimir Putin due to Belarus's growing ties with China. These developments are significant given Belarus's recent military cooperation with China, including joint exercises and its accession to the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. This shift appears to be unsettling for Russia, which recently sent kamikaze drones into Belarusian airspace, likely as a warning to both Lukashenko and China. The Chinese, in turn, may be pressuring Lukashenko to resolve the ongoing migrant crisis at the Polish-Belarusian border, which has been detrimental to China's economic interests in the region. Latushko's analysis suggests that Lukashenko's current maneuvering between Moscow and Beijing reflects his diminishing autonomy. His attempts to project strength and control are increasingly seen as hollow by Western observers. The ongoing crisis at the Polish border remains a key point of contention, with Poland leveraging economic measures, such as potentially suspending the flow of goods to pressure the Belarusian regime. The situation remains fluid, with Lukashenko's political future and Belarus's international alignments hanging in the balance. And now, here to share more light on the issue is Ananta Kotal, a form of Democratic Forces of Belarus. Hello, sir, and welcome to Eastern Express. Hello. Nice to, uh, nice, to, nice to see you. So whenever we talk about the plight of the Belarusian people, there's this thing that I keep hearing from Belarusian guests that well, the plight of the Belarusian people have a name, and it's called Alexander Lukashenko. Now, with uh, Lukashenko actually signifying his mortality or the possibility of stepping down, do you think that the situation in Belarus will change for the better? Or will he just continue his regime throughout his sons or his associates? Actually, it's a very tricky question and a very tricky issue um, because uh, if Lukashenko steps down and uh, more pro Russian uh, person comes, uh, into his into his place, um, that would be definitely 
um, worse for Belarusian people and for, for the region um, as a whole. Uh, this doesn't mean that I'm uh, pro Lukashenko and I don't want uh, uh, for him to step down, but uh, uh, the main issue is uh, who will substitute him. It's better uh, for sure that uh, uh, some sort of uh, democracy uh, structure uh, or democracy institute will uh, um, will come into his place. But uh, unfortunately, uh, as for the moment, uh, the major player uh, in Belarus is Russia, and I guess uh, it's Russia is uh, putting a pressure on him to step down. All right. Uh, so this might be looking at uh, be careful what you wish for a situation with the Lukashenko possibly gone. The power vacuum might actually invite someone that is perhaps more pro-Russian. What are the chances of that actually happening? I could mention it's perhaps Putin that is trying to make Lukashenko step down. So. Well, one could possibly conclude that he wanted to reinstate someone that is even stronger when it comes to their st stance in supporting Russia. Uh, that's true, because uh, if we look at the current situation, actually, uh, it remains uh, the same for almost 30 years that the major player in Belarus, if we speak about uh, foreign, uh, foreign uh, actors, it's Russia. And uh, it's Russia who is uh, putting more and more pressure on Lukashenko since 2020. Uh, and it's Russia who I would say uh, is uh, to some extent a last resort for Lukashenko, and this is a method of uh, controlling him. Now, uh, it's, uh, I would say, a new reality uh, in uh, Russian-Ukrainian war. Uh, uh, Ukrainian forces are uh, attacking uh, uh, Kursk uh, uh, region, and uh, of course uh, Russia needs uh, more troops, more support from so-called allies, and the closest ally is Lukashenko. And probably for Russia now, it's uh, um, uh, it's a dilemma uh, how to engage uh, Belarus um, into the war with or without Lukashenko. The main uh, issue is the result, and uh, of course. Uh, uh, some sort of political transit uh, about which Lukashenko starts to speak right now. He um, uh, also introduced uh, or about to introduce a special uh, article to criminal code which will prosecute uh, people for their, I would say, uh, disregard to former president. And we, at the moment, we still uh, have only one president of Belarus. So he's uh, slightly preparing to step in down. But uh, this, uh, 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 this action uh, now is more controlled by Russia. And this means that Russia wants to engage Belarus into the war against Ukraine uh, due to the uh, recent development uh, of the, the situation on the battleground. All right, so there's a lot of moving pieces here that we have to figure out. And of course, the thing that stands out to me most is how you mentioned uh, Russia's incentive of replacing Lukashenko is maybe to force them to kind of participate in this war in Ukraine. And of course, I can imagine that not going very well with the Belarusian people. Don't you think that's going to cause even more uproar and more pushback? And do you think while Lukashenko stepping down, there will be any sort of window of opportunity, any glimmer of hope for the more democratic forces? to kind of participate in kind of throwing a wrench into their plans? Should uh, Western countries, uh, should Western allies uh, decide to play more uh, active role uh, in fate of Belarus uh, as a country, as a nation, as a territory, uh, there will be a window of uh, opportunities uh, for sure. But uh, it's about... Uh, political will, because uh, it's uh, not only about some sort of wishful thinking, it's also about uh, 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 getting in, in into a direct conflict with uh, 
uh, Russia, which uh, was avoided uh, by the moment by Western countries, because it's not only about assisting Belarusian people to make, uh, I would say, a uh, right choice to get back um, to Europe, uh, to European perspective. It's also about the readiness to support and to defend um, this choice, because uh, at the moment, uh, Belarusian people are frightened uh, as uh, the nation and uh, there are two major players Lukashenko and his regime and Putin and his regime in Belarus there is almost uh, almost no room for uh, Europe uh, and the European choice so uh, in order to open this window of opportunity um, Western countries uh, should be I would say more uh, strong, more decisive, uh, like uh, uh, like in the moment when the Baltic states uh, uh, accessed uh, the uh, European uh, sphere, European Union uh, at the end. All right. So, like I mentioned, it is up for the Western allies and their political will to perhaps uh, grasp this potential window of opportunity. And of course, like you mentioned, again, it requires strength and decisiveness. But when it comes to the more practical side of things, how would you interpret that? How would you see any uh, practical things that the Western allies can do to contribute to that and to show that kind of strength and decisiveness? Uh, first of all, um, uh, they should should agree that uh, Belarus, uh, at least as a territory, should be included into the um, sphere of uh, security of uh, European countries. Uh, it's uh, almost the same issue like uh, uh, in 2022 uh, arise and Russia started a war against Ukraine uh, even earlier. Yeah, uh, in 2014, then actually the first invasion uh, came into place. That uh, once um, the post-Soviet countries uh, are making their choice uh, uh, in in a favor uh, of uh, Europe, in a favor of the Western civilization, uh, there is a conflict with uh, Russia. So first of all. Um, there should be uh, readiness to recognize the geopolitical situation that uh, Belarusian people uh, alone they cannot and they can make their choice but they uh, won't uh, have a chance to defend it uh, against uh, Russia. All right, so, and of course, uh, when we're talking between uh, Belarus, uh, the situation in Belarus and the struggle between Russia and the EU, there's also a major player that we seem to have neglected, namely China. Do you think that their presence will also come into play when it comes to this whole calculation? And where do you think China will lie? Is it going to be more uh, for Russia, against Russia? What's, what's your take? Uh, my take is that, uh, uh, that China is uh, pro-China, uh, and it will remain pro-China. And this is actually uh, a key or a clue to finding a solution. Uh, China is extremely pragmatic country. Uh, yes, uh, it's uh, not the example of a democracy, for sure, but uh, it's... Uh, an example of how it's better to trade than to fight. And uh, if we speak about uh, Belarusian situation, uh, they are interested in uh, having good, uh, in keeping good relationship with European Union in, and in having stability uh, on their silk route. Uh, it's um, not only about logistics and, and transit, it's also about uh, uh, some production on Belarusian territory. So there is a room to negotiate with China to keep them uh, stick to their pro-Chinese uh, stance, uh, pro-Chinese position and to be pragmatic. Belarusian uh, regime uh, or uh, even Belarusian regime substituted by some pro-Russian uh, politician uh, will uh, strike into Chinese interests. It's better to have more Europe uh, in Belarus, uh, more West in Belarus to secure Chinese interests. 
Right. So at least at the time being, it does seem like it will be in Belarus's interest to kind of keep that line open. We're looking at so many moving pieces. It's not just a geopolitical chessboard anymore with so many factions trying to play into this. So thank you so much for helping us breaking this down, helping us getting a deeper understanding of the situation on the ground. Appreciate it. Thanks again for being with us on Eastern Express. Thank you. See you. And now we move on to the Eastern News Flash, a series of all the other stories from the East that you don't want to miss. According to the U.S. ambassador to Turkey, the United States is urging Turkey and other allies with connections to Iran to encourage Tehran to ease tensions in the Middle East. The request comes amid fears of retaliatory attacks by Iran following the assassination of the political leader of Hamas in Tehran on July 31st. Iran blames Israel for the killing of Ismail Haniyeh, though Israel has not claimed responsibility. U.S. Ambassador to Turkey Jeff Flake has acknowledged Turkey's efforts to prevent further escalation in the region, but also noted that U.S.-Turkey relations, while improved, remain complex. Issues such as Turkey's purchase of Russian S-400 defense systems and differing stances on Gaza continue to cause friction between the countries. However, Flake praised Turkey's logistical role in the latest significant U.S.-Russia prisoner exchange, reflecting a cautious optimism about the future of U.S.-Turkey ties despite the ongoing challenges. Turkey has taken action to support Greece in containing the fires in Athens, sending two firefighting planes and a helicopter. The Turkish Foreign Ministry confirmed that the necessary steps have been taken to help the neighboring country during the difficult situation. The recent fire that broke out near Athens quickly spread due to strong winds, leading to the evacuation of nine villages and two hospitals, according to officials. The Foreign Minister of Turkey has conveyed the readiness of his government to help the Greeks with further support when needed. The declaration was positively received by Greece, although the decision to accept additional aid will be made depending on the further development of the situation. The Greek authorities have imposed a state of high alert in the regions threatened by the fires, with the government warning of continuing dangers until at least Thursday. Italy and Switzerland plan to include Russia in the next conference in Ukraine, believing that dialogue with all parties is key to achieving peace. The foreign ministers of both countries agreed to cooperate in organizing the second international meeting in which Russia would play an active role. The foreign ministers of both countries appealed to the international community to support a negotiation process based on the principles of respect for international law and territorial integrity. The first conference, held in June in Burgenstock, excluded Russia, a decision which was met with sharp criticism from Moscow. Russian leader Vladimir Putin has laid out his conditions for peace, including the withdrawal of Ukrainian forces from Donbas, along with Kiev abandoning its NATO aspirations. Nevertheless, the negotiations appear to be at an impasse, especially following the recent Ukrainian attacks on the Russian Kursk region. The United States has voiced concern about Iran's alleged plans to supply Russia with hundreds of ballistic missiles, which would significantly escalate the conflict in Ukraine. Russian military personnel are reportedly being trained in Iran to use the Fah-360 ballistic missile system, with the delivery of these missiles expected shortly. A contract was reportedly signed between Russian and Iranian officials in December 2023, involving both the FAT 360 and another missile system from Iran's military manufacturers. Meanwhile, Iran showcased its advanced Mohajer 10 drones at a military exhibition in Russia. These drones, capable of extended flight and carrying heavy payloads, are part of Iran's growing military export market. U.S. officials have previously accused Iran of supplying drones to Russia for use in Ukraine, though Tehran has denied these allegations. This development occurs amid increased tensions in the Middle East, with Iran threatening retaliation against Israel following the killing of a Hamas leader in Tehran. And that's all for now on Eastern Express. But for more news, update and commentary, please stay tuned to TPP World.